When I moved to Georgia in 2011, I discovered that having spent the better part of my life in Florida did not define me as a Southerner to many people. <laughs> Once I traded in Disney World, warm winters, and orange groves for Six Flags, red clay, and peach trees, I slowly began to discover the South in all its glory. Following a meeting one day, a colleague who had recently moved to Georgia from the Northeast remarked, you don't sound like you're from the South. You have a non-regional dialect. Where are you from? I responded, I'm from Florida. Oh, Florida's not the South, she informed me. Surely she knows where Florida is, I thought. Unlike residents of the Midwest who might struggle to pinpoint their home states on a blank US map, everyone knows where Florida is. Before I could reply, she clarified, Florida's progressive, plainly implying that the rest of the South is not. I grinned politely. Bless your heart, I told her. <laughs> In the South, bless your heart is used to express everything from sincere empathy to heartfelt thanks to genuine pity for a person whose obliviousness is beyond correction. <laughs> During the short while I'd lived in Georgia, I'd learned to deliver this versatile phrase expertly. My colleague walked away smiling. I would agree that Florida is progressive, especially when compared to its closest northern neighbors. I was born, raised, and educated in Florida. The local school system had been fully integrated for about five years before I entered kindergarten. I came of age amid MTV's airing of the first video by a black artist and the inaugural celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday as a federal holiday. My generation seemed to be reaping all the benefits of the civil rights movement, and I enjoyed my life in the Sunshine State, being raised as a part of a large, extended family with traditional Southern values. When people refer to the South, they're often referring to a way of life stereotypically characterized by slow living and blazing hot temperatures. They're referring to a place where restaurant servers are taken aback if you ask for unsweet tea. <laughs> or I use strangely if you think grits on the dinner menu is noteworthy. Where any man worth his salt has a dog that is literally his best friend. <laughs> and where every respectable lady has mastered her grandmother's recipe for banana pudding, 7-Up cake, or sweet potato pie. <laughs> These stereotypes may seem harmless, even charming, but these same people sometimes also describe the South as regressive and non-diverse, predominantly white with deeply held practices of racism and oppression and a desire to maintain the status quo in the name of upholding tradition and Southern culture. This is only partially true. Over the past few years, the South has seen a steady influx of residents, particularly from the Northeast, in 2018, the Northeast lost 352,000 residents to domestic migration, and two-thirds of them relocated to the South. Like my colleague, these new residents sometimes have misconceptions of the South as regressive and non-diverse, and these misconceptions combined with their different political perspectives may keep them from becoming fully engaged in what happens locally and statewide. When this happens, we fail to reap the benefits of their experiences and points of view that could create a better way of life for all of us. While there are places in the Deep South that still exist in the shade of Jim Crow's shadow, there are others where significant progress is taking place signaling the South's slow but steady transformation into a region that reflects our nation's growing diversity in politics and government. This transformation is evident in Louisiana. Just two decades after Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, David Duke, sometimes called the most charming bigot you ever met, was elected as state representative, Louisiana elected Indian American Payush Bobby Jindal as the 55th governor of the state, making him the first non-white governor ever elected. 
he won re-election by a landslide in 2011. This transformation is evident in Georgia. In 1987, no African Americans had lived in Forsyth County for 75 years following a violent racial cleansing. Residents asserted their desire to remain a whites-only county by staging a brotherhood march and stating their desires on national television. But change is inevitable. Although people of color now make up about 15% of this county's population, I'm sure residents who fought against this growth couldn't imagine that in 2018, Stacey Abrams, a black woman, would secure the Democratic Party's nomination for governor of the state of Georgia. She also made history as the first black woman to win a major party gubernatorial nomination in the history of the United States. Ms. Abrams graced the cover of Time magazine and reshaped the image of a high-ranking official in Georgia. This transformation is evident in Mississippi. Mississippi's state flag still has the Confederate symbol which some identify as a representation of Southern pride, but others identify as racist. In 2015, Governor Phil Bryan refused to support legislation to remove the Confederate symbol from the state flag, despite pressure from his own party. Instead, he defiantly issued a proclamation declaring April Confederate Heritage Month. Yet, Mississippi has a higher number of black elected officials than any other state. In the face of these important changes that promote gender and racial equality, and in light of the progressive political landscape that promotes true representation, if you still feel like the South can be summarily defined as a vowel-chopping drawl, fried food, and backwards thinking, well, then, bless your heart. <laughs> There's a rallying cry that claims the South will rise again. Those who utter these words allege to take pride in their Southern heritage, ignoring the horrifying behavior of their forefathers and hoping for the days of old when free labor and unearned privilege made living easy. Those days are gone. Ironically, the South is rising again. The South is rising as a social, political, and economic power that reflects the growing diversity of our nation, and we can all take part in the growth process. Following a meeting at a school for the children of freed slaves in the South, a retired Union general asked what message he should deliver upon his return to the North. A young student declared, Sir, tell them we are rising. So let's replace the controversial embattled expression with this new rallying cry that embodies all of the hope and optimism of the past and present and values everyone in our growing dynamic communities. Generations later, that young student's response is truer than it has ever been because we are rising. <laughs>